this is Rory McCann. I am an associate producer with Cambridge Health Tech Institute, and I'm here at Versatope in Lowell, Massachusetts with Dr. Christopher Loker. Dr. Loker, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us You're and to share a little bit more about Versatope and the great work that you are doing. So just to kick off, get started, you were recently awarded $17.9 million to develop a universal flu vaccine. Tell us a little bit about, uh, about the vaccine itself. What makes it a universal flu vaccine? Well, one of the major differences that we do is that we uh, combine different strains of flu onto a single particle. So it's a single product that contains multiple sequences from diverse influenza strains. And in that regard, we don't have to try to predict what the new fl uh, flu strain will be in uh, the upcoming season, which is typically done with the flu vaccine. And we're able to genetically engineer and put discrete domains on the surface of the particle that enable the immune response to respond to diverse strains. So we have multiple strains contained on a single particle. That's primarily what's different about it. The second thing is, is that we don't use fertilized chicken eggs. That's typically how influenza vaccines are made. They uh, inoculate the eggs with the virus and then they harvest the uh, influenza virus after it grows for a few days and they formal and inactivate it. So the influenza virus is no longer um, pathogenic or virulent. And when they do that, the only thing that's left are very strain-specific domains, for example, primarily hemagglutinin. And that's a, 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 a dominant surface protein on the surface of the flu virus. In contrast, what we've done is we've focused on an ion channel that's also expressed on the surface of the virus, but more predominantly it's on the virus-infected cell. So rather than having immunity that blocks neutralization and attachment of the virus, what we're controlling is the um, levels of viruses inside infected cells. So it's, it's a little bit different type of an immune response where it doesn't block virus attachment, but rather it induces immunity and protects against disease. And what was the process like getting to this point? Versatope has been up and running for two years. That seems like not a lot of time to have accomplished so much. Can you share a little bit about the process for uh, receiving the grant? Sure. Well, um, the work originated at Cornell University uh, with two professors, um, Dave Putnam and Matt DeLisa. So Matt DeLisa is actually a molecular biologist and he did the genetic engineering of the flu proteins. And then Dave is a, a chemical engineering and formulations person. So he actually formulated the flu vaccine using these vesicles uh, technologies and by using these vesicle technologies he also evaluated them and showed that they could get good protection against diverse strains of flu. Um, because I, I've known uh, Dave for, for a number of years um, we formed a company uh, Versatope two years ago and uh, he wanted to uh, launch it in, in the Cambridge area or the Boston area. So uh, we chose Lowell as our, our launching uh, point after looking at several incubators and, and uh, places for startups to, to uh, get going. What was the grant process like leading up to finally being awarded it? Sure, so we've written several grants. Um, not all of them get funded. Um, we've written quite a few, for example, uh, targeting influenza. We've also written other grants to look at the, the immunopotency of our vesicle technology and um, also to apply them to other diseases. Um, but the influenza ones, because we had strong preliminary data uh, that came from Cornell, that enabled us to, to get a proof of concept, really, that our vaccine had legs, so to speak, or that was going to be a viable product. Um, and then the uh, NIH, National Institutes of Health, uh, had a request for proposals, or RFPs, and they have made universal influenza vaccines a high priority for the United States and for uh, health in general. Uh, partly because new flu strains are always emerging and also because um, it's difficult to predict what the new fl flu strain will be in the upcoming season. Um, as a result, the flu vaccines have, uh, are very variable in terms of their efficacy. So last year, I believe the CDC reported that the flu vaccine was 29% efficacious. Um, so the NIH and other uh, Health and Human Services departments realize that there is a huge need for a universal flu vaccine, something that covers more than one strain. 
Um, and the definition of, of universal is is uh, been buttoned down a little bit better than what is what it was before. So it includes both avian and swine strains, as well as human season, human seasonal flus. So what is next for the vaccine candidate as you are developing and moving forward? You've had this great success in two years. What are the next steps moving forward in developing this? Sure, so we have to make, make what they call a master cell bank. Uh, so that whole has to be qualified and done uh, with uh, good manufacturing practices or GMP. So we're working with organizations that do this routinely and we're doing a lot of the preliminary work here uh, at the UMass Lowell Incubator because there's a lot of equipment uh, available to us and also the expertise and the Department of uh, Chemical Engineering and Bioengineering here. So um, we have access here at the incubator to develop the cells, but then to actually develop the process, we're uh, collaborating with the University of Massachusetts in Lowell. So it's, it's a good location for us. Uh, they're, they're big on biotech, and um, we have the resources we need to do the job here. And, and then work with uh, other folks that actually do the, the GMP manufacturing bit. Now, throughout this process, have you learned anything that you feel going forward has stronger implications for startups in the Boston area or just the biotech industry in the Boston area that's really been booming for the last several years? What has this process given you any insight into the industry? Well, that it's difficult, that it's not easy. Uh, it takes time, it takes patience, and, and it takes uh, repetition and persistence. Uh, you, you really have to be persistent. So for example, when we don't get a research grant, we uh, address the comments of the reviewers and we resubmit it, and you just keep doing it. Um, it's like rolling the rock uphill, but you just have to keep at it. And if you have um, a strong team with people with core expertises in individual domains, we can all pull together to uh, co cover each other's uh, weak areas, if you will, because not everybody can be an expert in everything. Um, so we try to get uh, key people that are experts in very specific areas. And then when we work together, we're able to synergize our efforts and move a project forward. Wow. Well, it seems like you guys have done an awesome job moving this project forward. What's next for Versatope? Um, well, meeting our milestones. So, so the, the, the large um, contract that we have with the National Institutes of Health is based on milestones. So um, we have to meet our first milestone, which is actually developing a process. So that's number one. And we have to do that in short order. So we're, that's what we're working on uh, currently. Uh, the second thing is um, to develop a stability process and evaluate the stability. And then of course the uh, manufacturing, show that it's safe and well tolerated, work with the uh, Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, for the regulatory requirements before we go into people. Uh, but over the course of four to five years, what we want to do is, is show that our vaccine candidate is safe and well tolerated and induces immunity uh, broadly to a diverse set of pandemic strains of influenza. Do you see other applications for this vaccine, may, might not necessarily for influenza, but the concepts, do you see other applications long-term uh, yes. goals. For the company, yes. So, so what we have is a technology platform. Our vesicles are kind of like liposomes. They're these small lipid micelles that form like bubbles, if you will, of, of fat. Uh, and, and they're produced by cells in general. Uh, our own cells make them. They're called exosomes. So bacteria also make them as well. But bacteria, they're called membrane vesicles. Or in the case of gram-negative bacteria, they're called outer membrane vesicles. So these little blebs of fat can be used not only to deliver vaccines, but they've been shown in nature to actually deliver RNA. And people have used these to help uh, cure cancer, uh, albeit in mice, uh, but it's a good start to show a proof of concept that you can actually inject these little vesicles with RNA to help modulate the immune response and help cure cancer or reduce the tumor growth. So cancer is one application. Um, we do have unpublished data and allergy as well that also came from Cornell. 
uh, peanut allergy. So we can actually engineer uh, sugar residues on the surface of these to help attenuate a inflammatory response depending on how it's administered for allergy. Um, you can also, like I said, you could probably deliver small molecules. That's something that we're interested in. So you can use them as a drug delivery system, uh, not unlike uh, liposomes. And um, there's ways you can actually make these and clean them up so that they're less immunogenic. But in the case of our vaccines, we want them to be immunogenic. So they're, they're a versatile platform, so we named the company Versatope because of its versatility. Um, so you can use them for therapeutic delivery as well as vaccines. It starts with the flu and the sky's the limit. <laughs> <laughs> Answer to peanut allergies. <laughs> well, it's a liposome technology is what it is. So anything you can imagine a liposome could do, it's possible we could do it with our technology as well. And those are the types of questions we want to answer as a, as a basic research and development program. So we want to um, have a, a robust R&D program where we're innovative and we're still doing new things with the platform. But at the same time, we want to move products forward and deliver on them uh, in the case of an influenza vaccine, for example. That's awesome. Is there anything else about this project or about where Versatope is now that uh, you think it's exciting and you want the world to know? Um, I, th I think Lowell is a pretty exciting place. Really? Just the location, I do. Um, because um, Cambridge has gotten so expensive for early stage startups and for us to rent a bench there, it's, 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 it's can be prohibitive. Certainly when you're starting out and if you're on a small business and innovation research brand or an SBIR, it's tough. I mean, it's, it's, it's really hard to make ends meet. Secondly is uh, the team of, of people. So we're recruiting now and we're building our team. Um, a lot of people are local in, in the area. Uh, we have some people that actually live in Lowell, uh, which is actually convenient for them. Uh, for me, it's a, it's a much shorter commute, even though I'm equidistant between Cambridge and Lowell. Uh -huh. It takes me about one sixth of the time to commute to Lowell than it does to commute to Cambridge. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's probably on a good day. <laughs> um, so it, it just it, it's more convenient to be in Lowell. Uh, it's more cost effective. Uh, the people are nice. We have the resources in Lowell to do what we need to do through the university. They've actually enabled us to do a lot more than what we could do at other incubators and other spaces if we were in Cambridge, for example. For example, library services, databases, that kind of thing. We have access to scientific journals. We have access to their core facilities. They have all this big expensive equipment that is really difficult to get access to when you're at a typical incubator space. Okay, well that that leads me to another question. It seems pretty obvious that you, know, that you have so many universities in the area in the Northeast, uh, in Massachusetts. You have so many universities and research centers around here. Why do you think that Cambridge is the one that everyone is kind of going to, even though it's clear it's very, it, like you said, uh, it's expensive and there's already a lot going on there and there's only so much. It used to not always be so expensive. Mm -hmm. So with the big pharma companies moving in, like Baxter came in and um, Sanofi and BMS now, um, it, it was uh, it, it's raised the price up because people are willing to pay more money mm -hmm. uh, for for the office and laboratory space. But small startup companies like the Garage Biotechs, I mean Vertex started um, down on Alston Street at an old garage. You know, it was it was pretty fit like the Car Talk guys. Mm -hmm. You know, they were just right around the corner. You know, and um, so Convenient. it was. You know, and it, it was it was hard. You know, because it was around the corner from the Methadone Clinic. I mean, you know, people were on the street and that kind of thing. So. If you look around Lowell, it's not too far where Cambridge used to be. Okay. Um, and I, I think that Cambridge was affordable, you know, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, but now it's just gotten priced out because of the demand for space and the big pharma companies willing to pay for it. Um, will that change in Lowell? I, I don't know. Uh, probably, it's just a matter of time. I kind of see Lowell as kind of the new Cambridge, really, that more companies will, will gravitate towards here. If you look at some of the old mills, like uh, the boot mill just down the road, I mean, there's, it's, it's full of startup companies, high-tech uh, companies, um, you know, uh, uh, software, 
there's a biotech company there as well. So um, I think people, when they when the space is created, um, like I don't want to say a sandbox, but it's like where people can come and they can work and create new things. Uh, that's what Cambridge did. It enabled that innovation to happen. And with MIT and Harvard there, of course, it had the pool of talent uh, of postdocs and, and research uh, fellows that, that want to do startups and work in that environment. It's, it's readily accessible. But as people get older, they get married, they have kids, they move to the suburbs, uh, you know, because of the school district. So people tend to gravitate out of Cambridge and then to work there becomes more challenging because they have to commute in and the infrastructure just isn't there to support it. And as a result, people have up to two hour commutes. Wow. Well, it seems like you are all making a great space for yourselves, not just in Lowell, but also in the industry. So congratulations on that. And we're excited to see where you, where you grow from there. Yes, <laughs> me too. Thanks for Thank you.